Okay. So I think we're on chapter, I think this is five, um, arithmetic. Matilda longed for her parents to be good and loving and understanding and honorable and intelligent. The fact that they were none of these things was something she had to put up with. It was not easy to do, to do so, but the new game she had invented of punishing one or both of them each time they were beastly to her made her life more or less bearable. Being very small and very young, the only power Matilda had over anyone in her family was brain power. For sheer cleverness, she could run rings around them. Uh, but the fact remained that any five-year-old girl in any family was always obliged to do so, do it as she was told, however asinine the orders might be. Thus, she was always forced to eat her evening meals out of TV dinner trays in front of the dreaded box. She always had to stay alone on weekend after or weekday afternoons, and whatever she was told to sh whenever she was told to shut up, she had to shut up. Can you, hey Leah? There's some construction. I'm sitting outside and there's some construction next door. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's, they're doing some serious sawing over there. Um, okay. Her safety valve, the thing that prevented her from going around the bend, um, was the fun of devising and dishing out these splendid punishments. And the lovely thing um, was that they seemed to work, at any rate, for short periods. The father, in particular, became less cocky and unbearable for several days after receiving a dose of Matilda's magic medicine. The paired in the chimney affair quite definitely cooled both parents down a lot, and for over a week, they were comparatively civil to their small daughter. But alas, this couldn't last. The next flare-up came one evening in the sitting room. Mr. Wormwood had just returned from work. Matilda and her brother were sitting quietly on the sofa waiting for their mother to bring their TV dinners on a tray. The television had not yet been switched on. In came Mr. Word Wormwood um, in a loud check suit and a yellow tie. The appalling broad orange and green check of the jacket and trousers almost blinded the onlooker. He looked like a low-grade bookmaker dressed up for his daughter's wedding, and he was clearly very pleased with himself this evening. He sat down in an armchair and rubbed his hands uh, together and addressed his son in a loud voice. Well, my boy, he said, your father has had a most successful day. He's a lot richer tonight than he was this morning. He has sold no less than five cars, each at one at a tidy profit. Sawdust in the gearbox, an electric drill on the speedometer cables, a splash of paint here and there, and a few other clever tricks. And the idiots were all falling over themselves to buy. He fished a bit of paper from his pocket and studied it. Listen, boy, he said, addressing the son and ignoring Matilda. Seeing as you are going into this business with me one day, you've got to know how to add up the profits you make at the end of each day. Go ahead and get yourself a pad and pencil and let's see how clever you are. The son obediently left the room and re returned with writing materials. Write down to these figures, the, the father said, reading from a bit of paper. Car number one was bought by me for 278 pounds and sold for 1,425. You got that? The 10-year-old boy wrote down two separate amounts, down slowly and carefully. Car number two, the father went on, cost me 180 pounds, 18 pounds and sold for 760. Got it? Yes, dad, the son said, I've got that. Car number three cost 111 pounds and sold for 999 pounds and 50 pence. Say that again, the son said. How much did it sell for? 999 pounds and 50 pence, the father said. And that, by the way, is another of my nifty little tricks to diddle the customer. Never ask for a big round figure. Always go just below it. Never say 1,000 pounds. Always say 999.50. It always sounds much less, but it isn't. Clever, isn't it? Very, the son said. You're brilliant, dad. Car number four cost 86 pounds, a real wreck it was, and sold for 699 pounds 50. Not too fast, the son said, writing the numbers down. Right, I've got it. Car number five cost 637 pounds and sold for 1649, or 4950. You got all those figures written down, son? Yes, daddy, the boy said, crouching over his pad, carefully writing. Very well, the father said, now work out the profit that I made on each of the five cars and out of the total. Then you'll be able to tell me how much money your father, your rather brilliant father made all together today. That's a lot of sums, the boy said. Of course it's a lot of sums, the father answered. But when you're in big business like I am, you've got to have, you got to be hot stuff at arithmetic. I, uh, I practically got a computer inside my head. It took me less than 10 minutes to work out the whole thing. You mean you did it in your head, dad? The boy asked, or the son asked, not, or asked goggling. Well, not exactly, the father said. Nobody could do that, but it didn't take me long. When you're finished, tell me what you think my profit was for the day. I've got the final total written down here, and I'll tell you if you're right. 
Matilda said quietly, Dad, you made exactly 4,303 pounds and 50 pence altogether. Don't butt in, the father said. Your brother and I are busy with high finance. But Dad. Shut up, the father said. Stop guessing and try and be clever. Look at your answer, Dad, Matilda said gently. If you've done it right, it ought to be 4,303 pounds and 50 pence. Is that what you got, Dad? The father glanced down at the paper in his hand. He seemed to stiffen. He became very quiet. There was a silence. Then he said, say that again? 4,303 pounds 50, Matilda said. There was another silence. The father's face was beginning to go dark red. I'm sure it's right, Matilda said. You little cheat, the father suddenly shouted, pointing at, his, at her with his finger. You looked at my bit of paper. You read it off from what I'd written down here. Daddy, I'm on the other side of the room, Matilda said. How could I possibly see it? Don't give me that rubbish, the father shouted. Of course you looked. You must have looked. No one in the world could give an, the right answer just like that, especially a girl. You're a little cheat, madam, and that's, that's what you are, a cheat and a liar. At that point, the mother came in carrying a large tray on which there were four suppers. This time it was fish and chips, with, which Mrs. Wormwood had picked up in the fish and chip shop on her way home from Bingo. It seemed that Bingo afternoons left her so exhausted, both physically and emotionally, she never had enough energy left to cook an evening meal. So if it wasn't TV dinners, it had to be fish and chips. What are you looking so red in the face about, Harry? She asked as she put the tray down on the coffee table. Your daughter is a cheat and a liar, the father said, taking his plate of fish and placing it on her, his knees. Turn the telly on and let's not have any more talk. The Platinum Blonde Man. There's no doubt in Matilda's mind that this latest display of foulness by her father deserves severe punishment. And as she sat eating her awful fried fish and fried chips and ignoring the television, her brain went to work on various possibilities. By the time she went up to bed, her mind was made up. The next morning, she got up early and went to the bathroom and locked the door. As we already know, Mrs. Wormwood's hair was dyed brilliantly platinum blonde, um, very much the same glistening silvery color as female tightrope as female tightrope walkers' tights in a circus. The big dyeing job was done twice a year at the hairdresser, but every month or so in between, Mrs. Wormwood used to freshen it up, used uh, to freshen it up by giving it a rinse in the wash basin with something called platinum blonde hair dye extra strong. Um, this also served to dye the nasty brown hairs that kept growing from the roots underneath. The bottle of Platinum Blonde hair dye, extra strong, was kept in the cupboard in the bathroom, and underneath the tile, the, underneath the title on the label were written the words, Caution, this is peroxide. Keep away from children. Matilda had read it many times with fascination. Matilda's father had a fine crop of black hair, which he parted in the middle, um, which he parted in the middle, and of which he was exceedingly proud. Good strong hair, he said fond, he was fond of saying, meaning there is a good strong brain underneath. Like Shakespeare, Matilda once said to him, like who? Yeah. Shakespeare, daddy. Was he brainy? Very daddy. Um, he had masses of hair, did he? He was bald, daddy. To which the father had snapped, if you can't talk sense, then shut up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway, Mr. Wormwood kept his hair looking bright and strong, or so he thought, by rubbing into it every morning large quantities of a lotion called oil of violet's hair tonic, a bottle of the smelly purple mixture always stood on the shelf above the sink in the bathroom alongside the toothbrushes, and a very rigorous scalp massage uh, with oils of violet took place daily after shaving was completed. This hair and scalp massage <laughs> was always accompanied by a loud masculine grunts and heavy breathing and gasps of, ah, that's better, that's the stuff, rub it right into the roots, which would be clearly heard by Matilda in her bedroom across the corridor. Now, in the early morning privacy of the bathroom, Matilda unscrewed the cap of her father's oil of violets and tipped three quarters of the contents down the drain. Then she filled the bottle up with her mother's platinum blonde hair dye extra strong. She carefully left enough of her father's original hair tonic in the bottle, so when he gave it a good shake, the whole thing still looked reasonably purple. Then she replaced the bottle on the shelf above the sink, taking care to put her mother's bottle back in the cupboard. So far, so good. At breakfast time, Matilda sat quietly at the dining room table eating her cornflakes. Her brother sat opposite her with his back to the door, devouring hunks of bread smothered with a mixture of peanut butter and strawberry jam. The mother was just out of sight around the corner in the kitchen making Mr. Wormwood's breakfast, which always had to be two fried eggs on, on fried bread with three pork sausages and three strips of bacon and some fried tomatoes. At this point, Mr. Wormwood came noisily into the room. He was incapable of entering any room quietly, especially at breakfast time. He always had to make an appearance, um, had to had to make his appearance felt immediately by creating a lot of noise and clatter. 
One could almost hear him saying, it's me, here I come, the great man himself, the master of the house, the wage earner, the one who makes it possible for all the rest of you to live so well. Notice me and pay me your respects. On this occasion, he strode in, slapped his son on the back, and shouted, well, my boy, your father feels like he's in for another great money-making day today at the garage. Um, I've got a few little beauties I'm going to flog to the idiots this morning. Where's my breakfast? It's coming, treasure, Mrs. Wormwood called from the kitchen. Matilda kept her face low over her cornflakes. She didn't dare look up. In the first place, she wasn't at, wasn't at all sure uh, what she was going to see. And secondly, if she did see what she thought she was going to see, she wouldn't trust herself to keep a straight face. The son was looking directly ahead out the window and stuffing himself with bread and peanut butter and strawberry jam. The father was just moving around, um, moving around to sit at the head of the table when the mother came sweeping out of the kitchen carrying a huge plate piled high with eggs and sausages and bacon and tomatoes. She looked up, she caught sight of her husband, and she stopped dead. Then she let out a scream that seemed to lift her right up into the air, and she dropped the plate with a crash and a splash onto the floor. Everyone jumped, including Mr. Wormwood. What the heck is the matter with you, woman? He shouted. Look at the mess you've made on the carpet. Your hair, the mother shrieked, um, pointing a quivering finger at her husband. Look at your hair. What have you done to your hair? What's wrong with my hair, for heaven's sake, he said. Oh my god, dad, what have you done to your hair? The son shouted. A splendid noisy scene was building up nicely in the breakfast room. <laughs> Matilda said nothing. She simply sat there admiring her wonderful, uh, admiring her, the effect of her own handiwork. Mr. Worm Wormwood's fine crop of black hair was now dirty silver, the color of time of a tightrope, uh, the color of this time of tightrope walkers tights that had not been washed for the entire circus. You've, you've, you've dyed it, shrieked the mother. Why did you do that? Uh, why did you do it, you fool? It looks absolutely frightful. It looks horrendous. You look like a freak. Uh, what <laughs> places are you talking about? The father yelled, putting both hands to his hair. I most certainly have not dyed it. What do you mean I've dyed it? What's happened to it? Or is this some sort of stupid joke? His face was turning pale green, the color of most sour apples. You must have dyed it, Dad, the son said. It's the same color as Mum's, only much dirtier looking. Of course he's dyed it, the mother cried. You can't, it can't change color all by itself. What on earth were you trying to do? Make yourself look handsome or something? You look like someone's grandmother gone wrong. Give me a mirror, the father yelled. Don't just stand there shrieking at me. Give me a mirror. The mother's handbag lay on the chair in the other, at the end, other end of the table. She opened up the bag and got out uh, a powder compact that had a small round mirror on the inside of the lid. She opened up the compact and handed it to her husband. He grabbed it and held it before his face, and in doing so, spilled most of the powder over his front, over the front of his fancy tweed jacket. Be careful, shrieked the mother. Now look what you've done. That's my best Elizabeth Arden face powder. Oh my God, yelled the father, staring into the little mirror. What happened to me? I look terrible. I just look like, or I look just like you gone wrong. I can't go down to the garage and, to sell cars like this. How did this happen? He stared around the room first at the mother and then the son and then Matilda. How could it ha oh, have God. happened? Um, he yelled. I imagine, Daddy, Matilda said quietly, that you weren't looking very hard and you simply took Mommy's bottle of hair stuff on the shelf instead of your own. Of course that's what happened, the mother cried. Well, really, Harry, how stupid can you be? Why didn't you read the label before you started splashing that stuff all over you? Mine's terribly strong. I'm only meant to use one tablespoon of it in a whole basin of water, and you've gone and put it all over your head neat. It'll probably take all of your hair off at the end. Is, is your scalp beginning to burn, dear? You mean I'm going to lose all of my hair? The husband yelled. I think you will, the mother said. Peroxide is a very powerful, powerful chemical. It's what they uh, put down the lavatory to disinfect the pan, um, only they give it another <laughs> name. <laughs> What are you saying? The husband cried. I'm not a lavatory pan. I don't want want to be disinfected. Um, even diluted like I use it, the mother told him. It makes a good deal of my hair fall out, so goodness knows what's going to happen to you. I'm surprised it didn't take the whole top of your head off. What shall I do? wailed the father. Tell me quick, what should I do before it starts falling out? I'd give it a good wash, Dad, if I were you, with soap and water, but you'll have to hurry. Um, will that change the color back? The father asked anxiously. Of course it won't, you twit, the mother said. Then what do I do? I can't go around looking like this forever. You'll have to have it dyed black, the mother said, but wash it first so there won't be any there to dye. Right, the father shouted, springing into action. Give me an appointment with your hairdresser this instant for a hair dyeing job. Tell them it's an emergency. They've got to boot up something, boot someone off their list. Um, I'm going upstairs to wash it now. 
With, uh, with that, the man dashed out of the room and Mrs. Wormwood sighed deeply, went to the telephone to call the beauty parlor. He does do some pretty silly things now and again, doesn't he, mummy? Matilda said. The mother, dialing the number on the phone, said, I'm afraid men are not always quite as clever as they think they are. You will learn that when you get a bit older, my dear. And meanwhile, right. she died her father's Miss sister. Honey. She did it. Uh, Matilda was late, a little late in starting school. Most children in primary school at five, or even just before, uh, most children begin primary school at five, or even just before, but Matilda's parents, who weren't very concerned one way or another about their daughter's education, had forgotten to make the proper arrangements in advance. She was five and a half school for the first time. The village school for younger children was a bleak brick building called Crencham Hall Primary School. It had about 250 people as age five to just under 12 years old. The head teacher, the boss, the supreme commander of the establishment was the formidable mi middle-aged lady whose name was Miss Trunchbull. Naturally, Matilda was put in the bottom of the class where the 18 other small boys and girls um, about the same age as her. Um, their teacher was called Miss Honey, and she could not have been more than 23 or 24. She had a lovely pale oval Madonna face with blue eyes, and her hair was light brown. Her body was so slim and fragile that one got the feeling that as she fell over, she would smash into a thousand pieces like a porcelain figure. Miss Jennifer Honey was a mild and quiet person who never raised her voice and was seldom seen to smile, but there was no doubt that she possessed a rare gift for being adored by every small child under her care. She seemed to understand totally the bewilderment and fear that so often overwhelms young children for the first time in their lives um, are herded into a classroom and told to obey orders. Some curious warmth that was almost tangible shown at... Um, shown out of Miss Honey's face when she spoke to a confused and homesick newcomer to the class. Miss Trunchbull, the headmistress, was some, something else altogether. She was a gigantic holy terror, a fierce tyrannical monster who frightened the life out of peoples and teachers alike. There was an aura of menace about her, even at a distance, and when she came up close, you could almost see, feel the dangerous heat radiating, radiating from her, uh, from a, as, uh, radiating from her as from a red hot rod of metal. When she marched, Miss Trunchbull never walked. She always marched, um, like the storm, like a stormtrooper with red or long strides and arms a swinging. When she marched along the corridor, you could actually hear her snorting as she went. And if a group of children happened to be in her path, she plowed right on through them like a tank with small, uh, with small people bouncing. Oh shoot, I lost my spot. Sorry. <laughs> um, she plowed right on through them like a tank with small people bouncing off her to the left and right. Thank goodness we don't meet many people like her um, in this world, although they do exist and all of us are likely to come across at least one of them in a lifetime. If you ever do, you should behave as um, you, would, you would if you met an enraged rhinoceros out into the, in the bush. Climb up the nearest tree and stay there until it has gone away. This woman and all of her ex uh, eccentricities in her appearance is almost impossible to describe, but I shall make some attempt to do so a little later on. Let us leave her for the moment and go back to Matilda in her first day in Miss Honey's class. After the usual business of going through all of the needs of the children, Miss Honey handed out brand new exercise books to each people. Um, you have all brought your own pencils, I hope, she said. Yes, Miss Honey, they chanted. Good. Now this is the very first day of school for each of you. It's the beginning of at least 11 long years of schooling, um, that all of you are going to have to go through, and six of those years will be spent right here at Crunchum Hall, where, as you know, the fifth address is Miss Trunchbull. Let me, for your own good, tell you something about Miss Trunchbull. She insists upon strict discipline throughout her throughout the school, and if you take my advice, you will do your very best to behave yourselves in her presence. Never argue with her. Never answer her back. Always do as she says. If you get on the wrong side of Miss Trunchbull, she can li uh, liquidize you and like a carrot in a kitchen blender. It is nothing to laugh about, Lavender. Take that grin off your face. All of you will be wise to remember that Miss Trunchbull deals very, very severely with anyone who gets out of line at the school. Have you got the message? Yes, Miss Honey, chirped 18 eager little voices. I myself, Miss Honey went on, want to help you learn as much as possible while you're in this class. That is because I know it will make things a lot easier for you later on. For example, by the end of this week, I shall expect every one of you to know your two times tables by heart. And in a year's time, I hope you will know all the multiplication tables up to 12. Um, it will help you, do, help you enormously if you do. Now then, do any of you happen to have learned the two times tables already? 
Matilda put up her hand. She was the only one. Miss Honey looked at her carefully, looked carefully at the tiny girl with her dark hair and a round, serious face sitting in the second row. Wonderful, she said. Please stand up and recite as much of, much of it as you can. Matilda stand up and began to say the two times table. When she got up, uh, got to twice 12 is 24, she didn't stop. She went right on to twice 13 is 26, twice 14 is 28, twice 15 is 30, twice 16 is... Stop, Miss Honey said. She had been listening slightly spellbound at the smooth recital, and now she said, how far can you go? How far, Matilda said. Well, I don't really know, Miss Honey, for quite a long ways, I think. Miss Honey took a few moments to let this curious statement sink in. You mean that you could tell me what two times 28 is? Yes, Miss Honey. What is it? 56, Miss Honey. What about something much harder? Like, could you do two times 487? Could you tell me that? I think so, yes, Matilda said. Are you sure? Why, yes, Miss Honey, I'm fairly sure. What is it then? Two times 487. 974, Matilda said immediately. She spoke quietly and politely without any sign of showing off. Miss Honey gazed at Matilda with absolute amazement, but when she next spoke, um, she kept her voice level. That is really splendid, she said, but of course multiplying by two is a lot easier than some of the bigger numbers. What about other multiplication tables? Do you know any of those? I think so, Miss Honey. I think I do. Which ones, Matilda? How far have you got? I, I don't quite know, Matilda said. I don't know what you mean. What I mean, for instance, uh, what I mean is do you, for instance, know the three times table? Yes, Miss Honey. And the four times? Yes, Miss Honey. Well, how many do you know, Matilda? Do you know all the way up to the 12 times table? Yes, Miss Honey. What are 12 sevens? 84, Matilda said. Miss Honey paused and leaned back in her chair before the plain table that stood in the middle of the front of the class. Of the class. She was considerably shaken by this exchange but took care not to show it. She had never come across a five-year-old before, or indeed a 10-year-old who could multiply with such faculty, facility. Um, I hope the rest of you are listening to this, she said to the class. Matilda is a very lucky girl. She has wonderful parents who've already taught her to multiply lots of numbers. Was it your mother, Matilda, who taught you? No, Miss Honey, it wasn't. You must have a great father then. He must be a brilliant teacher. No, Miss Honey, Matilda said quietly. My father did not teach me. You mean you taught yourself? I don't quite know, Matilda said truthfully. It's just that I don't find it very difficult to multiply one number by another. Miss Honey took a deep breath and let it out slowly. She looked again at the small girl with bright eyes standing beside her desk, so sensible and solemn. You say you don't find it difficult to multiply one number by another, Miss Honey said. Can you explain? try to explain that a little bit? Oh dear, Matilda said, I'm not really sure. Miss Honey waited. The class was silent, all listening. For instance, Miss Sunny said, if I asked you to multiply 14 by 19, no, that's too difficult. It's 266, Miss, or Matilda said softly. Miss Honey stared at her, then she picked up a pencil and quickly worked out the sum on a piece of paper. What did you say it was, she said, looking up? 266, Matilda said. Miss Honey put down her pencil and removed her spectacles and began to polish the lenses with a piece of tissue. The class remained quiet, watching her and waiting for what was coming next. Matilda was still standing up behind her desk. Now tell me, Matilda, Miss Honey said, still polishing, try to tell me exactly what goes on inside your head when you get a multiplication like, when you get a multiplication like that to do. You obviously have to work it out in some way, but you seem to arrive at the answer almost instantly. Take the one you've just done, 14 multiplied 19. I, I, I simply put the 14 down in my head and multiply it by 19, Matilda said. I'm afraid I don't know how else to explain it. I've always said to myself that I, if I, a little pocky calculator can do it, why shouldn't I? Why not indeed, Miss Honey said. The human brain is an amazing thing. I think it's a lot better than a lump of metal, Matilda said. That's all a calculator is. How right you are, Miss Honey. Pocket calculators are not allowed in the school anyways. Miss Honey was feeling quite quivery. Um, there was no doubt in her mind that she had met a truly extraordinarily, extraordinary mathematical brain, uh, and her words like child genius and prod prodigy went flitting through her head. Uh, she knew that these sort of wonders do pop up in the world from time to time, but only once or twice in a hundred years. After all, Mozart was only five when he started composing for the piano, and look at what happened to him. It's not fair, Lavender said. How can, she, how can she do it, and we can't? Don't worry, Lavender. You'll soon catch up, Miss Honey said, lying through her teeth. At this point, Miss Honey could not resist the temptation of exploring still further the mind of the astonishing child. She knew that she ought to be paying some attention to the rest of the class, but uh, she was altogether too excited to let the matter rest. Well, she said, pretending to address the whole class, let's leave sums for the moment and see if any of you um, have begun to learn to spell. Hands up if any, or 
hands up if anyone who can spell cat. Three hands went up. They belonged to Lavender, a small boy called Nigel, and to Matilda. Spell cat, Nigel. Nigel spelled it. Miss Honey now decided she could ask a question that normally she would not have dreamed of asking the class on its first day. I wonder, she said, whether any of you three know how to spell cat, or who know how to spell cat have learned how to read a whole group of words when they are strung together in a sentence. <clears throat> I have, Nigel said. So have I, Lavender said. Miss Honey went to the blackboard and wrote, uh, and wrote with a white chalk the sentence, I have already begun to learn how to read long sentences. She had purposely made it difficult and she knew there were a precious few five-year-olds around who would be able to manage it. Can you tell me what that says, Nigel? She asked. That's too hard, Nigel said. Lavender? The first word is I, Lavender said. Can any of you read the whole sentence, Miss Honey said, asked, waiting for the yes from, that she felt certain was gonna come from Matilda. Yes, Matilda said. Go ahead, Miss Honey. Um, Miss Honey said, Matilda read the sentence without any hesitation at all. That's really, or that really is very good indeed, Miss Honey said, making the understatement of her life. How much can you read, Matilda? I think I can read most things, Miss Honey, Matilda said, although I'm afraid I can't always understand the meanings. Miss Honey got to her feet and walked smartly out of the room, but she was back in 30 seconds carrying a thick book. She opened it at random and placed it on Matilda's desk. This is a book of humorous poetry, she said. See if you can read one aloud. Smoothly, without a pause, and at a nice speed, Matilda began to read. An epicure dining at crew found a rather large mouse in his stew. Cry the waiter, don't shout, and wave it about, or the rest will be wanting with you. Seven children saw the funny side of the rhyme and laughed. And Miss Honey said, do you know what an epicure is, Matilda? It's someone who is dainty with his eating, Matilda said. That's correct. And do you happen to know what that particular type of poetry is called? It's called a limerick, Matilda said. That's a lovely one. It's so funny. It's a famous one, Miss Honey said, picking up the book and returning to her table in front of the class. A witty limerick is hard to write, she added. They look easy, but they're certainly not. I know, Matilda said. I've tried it quite a few times, but mine are never as good. You have, have you, Miss Honey, sa Miss Honey said, more startled than ever. Well, Matilda, I would very much like to hear one of these limericks you say you've written. Could you try to remember one for us? Well, Matilda said, hesitating. Um, I've actually been trying to make one up about you, Miss Honey, as while we've been sitting here. About me? Miss Honey cried. Well, we've certainly got to hear that one, haven't we? I don't think I want to say it, Miss Honey. Please tell me, Miss Honey said. I promise I won't mind. I think you will, Miss Honey, because I have to use your first name to make things rhyme, and that's why I don't want to say it. How do you know my first name, Miss Honey asked. I heard another teacher calling it, calling you by it when we, before we came in, Matilda said. She called you Jenny. I insist upon hearing the limerick, Miss Honey said, smiling, one of her rare smiles. Stand up and recite it. Reluctantly, Matilda stood up very slowly, very nervously, and recited her limerick. The thing we all ask about Jenny is surely there cannot be many young girls in the place with so lovely a face. The answer to that is not any. The whole of Miss Honey's pale, pleasant face blushed a brilliant scarlet. Then once again, she smiled. There's a much broad... Uh, the, it was a much broader one this time, and a smile of pure pleasure. Why, thank you, Matilda, she said, still smiling. Although it is not true, I mean, it is a really good limerick. Oh, dear, oh, dear, I must try to remember that one. From the third row of the desk, Lavender said, it's good, I like it. It's true as well, a small boy called Rupert said. Of course it's true, Nile, or Nigel said. Already the whole class had begun to warm towards Miss Honey, although she, as yet she had hardly taken any notice of any of them except Matilda. Who taught you to read, Matilda? Miss Honey asked. I just sort of taught myself, Miss Honey. And have you read any books by, all by yourself? Any children's books, I mean? I read all of the ones that are at the public library in High Street, Miss Honey. And did you like any of them? I liked some of them very much indeed, Matilda said, but I thought others were very, fairly dull. Tell me which ones, that, tell me the ones that you liked. I liked The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Matilda said. I think C.S. Lewis is a very good writer, but he has one failing. There are no funny bits in his books. You're right there, Miss Honey said. There aren't very many funny bits in Mr. Tolkien's either. Uh, do you think that all small children ought to be, have funny bits in that? All children's books ought to have funny bits in them, Miss Honey asked. I do, Matilda said. Children are not so serious as grown-ups, and they love to laugh. Miss Honey was astounded by the wisdom of the tiny girl. Um, she said, uh, tiny girl, she said, and what are you going to do now that you've read all the children's books? I'm reading other books, Matilda said. I borrowed them from the library. Mrs. Phelps is very kind to me and helps me choose them. Miss Honey was leaning far forward over her work table and gazing in wonder at the child. She had completely forgotten about the rest of the class. What other books, she murmured. 
I'm very fond of Charles Dickens, Matilda said. He makes me laugh a lot, especially Mr. Pickwick. At that moment, the bell in the corridor sounded for the end of class. <laughs> All right, I think we have one more time for one more chapter. The oh, trench. We're gonna learn about. Do you guys have time for one more chapter? Do we? Yeah. Do you have time in your forty minutes? I. Well, that's what I was. That's what I'm curious about. I haven't gotten a time signal yet. So, have you guys gotten okay. a time signal yet? No. All right, then I think we got one more time for one a chapter. Time. One more chapter to go. Okay. okay. <laughs> what was that, Leah? Enough time. Enough time, yeah. All right, one more chapter. What? The one trench bowl. Mm -hmm. In the interval. Good, good, good. Okay, put it down. No. All right, you ready, Leah? Yes. Okay. Yes. The trench bowl. In the interval, Miss Honey left the classroom and headed straight for the headmistress's study. She felt wildly excited. She had just met a small girl who possessed, or so it seemed to her, quite extraordinary qualities of brilliance. There had not been time to find out exactly how brilliant the child was, but Miss Honey had learned enough to realize that something had to be done about it as soon as possible. It would be ridiculous to leave a child like that stuck at the bottom in the bottom form. Normally, Miss Honey was terrified of the headmistress and kept well away from her, but at this moment, she felt ready to take on anybody. She knocked on the door of the dreaded private study. Enter, boomed the deep and dangerous voice of Miss Trenchbull. Miss Honey went in. Now, most head teachers are chosen because they possess a number of fi fine qualities. They understand children, and they have children's best interests at heart. They are sympathetic, they are fair, and they are deeply interested in education. Miss Trenchbull possessed none of these qualities. Um, and how she ever got present, got her present job was a mystery. She was above all a most formidable female. She had once been a famous athlete and even now her muscles were still clearly in evidence. You could see them in her bull neck and her big shoulders and in her thick arms and her sinewy wrist and the powerful legs. Looking at her, you got the feeling that this was someone who could bend iron bars near and tear telephone directories in half. Her face, I'm afraid, was neither a thing of beauty nor a nor joy forever, um, or yeah, forever. She had an obstinate chin and cruel mouth and small arrogant eyes, and for her clothes, they were to say the least, extremely odd. She always had a brown cotton smock on, which she pinched around the waist with a wide leather belt. The belt was fastened in front with an enormous silver buckle. The massive thighs which emerged from out of the smock were encased in a pair of extraordinary breeches, bottled green in color and made of coarse twill. These breeches reached just below the knees, and from there on down, she sort of sported green stockings with turn-up tops, uh, which displayed her calf muscles to perfection. On her feet, she wore flat-heeled brown brooks uh, with leather flaps. She looked in, looked in short more like a rather eccentric, bloodthirsty follower of staghounds and the headmistress of a nice school for children. When Miss Honey entered the study, Miss Trunchbull was standing beside her huge desk uh, um, with a look of scowling impatience on her face. Yes, Miss Honey, she said. What do you want? Um, you're looking very flushed and flustered this morning. What's the matter with you? Have those little stinkers been flicking spitballs at you? No, headmistress, nothing like that. Well, what is it then? Get on with it. I am busy. Oh, Miss I, I'm a busy woman. Busy. Look at her. Look at her. <laughs> As she Whoa. spoke, she reached out and poured herself a glass of water from a jug that she always had on her desk. There's a little girl in my class in, called Matilda Wormwood, Miss Honey began. That's the daughter of the man who owns Wormwood Motors in the village, Miss Trunchbull barked. She hardly ever spoke in a normal voice. She either barked or shouted. An excellent person, Wormwood, she went on. I was there only yesterday. He sold me a car, almost new, only done 10,000 miles. Previous owner was an old lady who took it out once a year at most. A terrific bargain. Yes, I liked Wormwood, a real pillar in our society. He told me the daughter was um, a bad lot, though. He said to watch her. He said, if anything bad ever happened in the school, it was certain to be his daughter who did it. I haven't met the little brat yet, but I know, or but she'll know about it when I do. Her father said that she was a real wart. Oh, no, headmistress, that can't be right, Miss Honey cried. Oh, yes, Miss Honey, it darn well is right. In fact, now I come to think of it, I'll bet she was the, fr the one, I'll bet it was she who put the stink bomb under my desk here first thing this morning. The place stank like a sewer. Of course it was her. I shall have her, you see if I, uh, you see if I don't, 
What does she look like? Nasty little worm. It'll be, I'll be bound. I've discovered, Miss Honey, during my long career as a teacher that a bad girl is far more dangerous than a creature, a dangerous creature than a bad boy. What's more, they're much harder to squash. Squashing a bad girl is like trying to squash a blue bottle. You bang down on it and the dirty thing isn't there. Nasty, dirty things. Little girls are. I'm glad I was never one. Oh, but you must have been a little girl once, uh, headmistress. Surely you were. Not for long anyways, Miss Trunchbull barked, grinning. I became a woman very quickly. She co she's completely off her rocker, Miss Holly t Honey told herself. She's uh, barmy as a bed bug. Miss Honey stood resolutely before the headmistress. For one, she was not going to be browbeaten. I must tell you, headmistress, she said, that you were completely mistaken about Matilda putting a stink bomb under your desk. I am never mistaken, Miss Honey. But headmistress, the only child arrived, or the child only arrived in school this morning and came straight to the classroom. Don't argue with me, for heaven's sake, woman. This little brute Matilda, or whatever her name is, um, has stink bombed my study. There's no doubt about it. Thank you for suggesting it. But I didn't suggest it, headmistress. Of course you did. Now what is it you want, Miss Honey? Why are you wasting my time? I came to talk to you about Matilda, headmistress. I have extraordinary things to report about the child. May I please tell you what happened in class just now? I suppose she set fire to your skirt and scorched your knickers, Miss Trunchbull snorted. No, no, Miss Honey cried out. Matilda is a genius. At the mention of this word, Miss Trunchbull's face turned purple and her whole body seemed to swell up like a bullfrog's. A genius, she well, shouted. Yeah. What pitfall is this that you're talking about, madam? You must be out of your mind. I gave her, I have her father's word um, for it that her ch the child is a gangster. Your father is wrong, her father is wrong, headmistress. Don't be a twerp, Miss Honey. You have met uh, the little beast for only half an hour and her father has known her her whole life. But Miss Honey was determined to have her say and she now began to describe some of the amazing things Matilda had done with arithmetic. So she's learned the f a few times tables by heart, has she? Miss Trunchbull barked. My dear woman, that doesn't make her a genius. It makes her a parrot. The headmistress, she can read. So can I, Miss Trunchbull snapped. It is my opinion, Miss Honey said, that Matilda should be taken out of my form and placed immediately in the top with the 11-year-olds. Ha! snorted Miss Trunchbull. So you want to get, uh, you want to get rid of her, do you? So you can't handle her? So now you want to unload her uh, on the, to the wretched Miss Plimsoll at the top form or she will cause even more chaos? No, no, cried Miss Honey, that is not my reason at all. Oh, yes it is, shouted Miss Trunchbull. I can see right through your little plot, madam, and my answer is no. Matilda stays where she is, and it is up to you to see that she behaves herself. But headmistress, please. Not another word, shouted Miss Trunchbull, and in any case, I have a rule in the school that all children remain in their own age groups regardless of ability. Great Scott, I'm not having a little five-year-old um, brig uh, brigand sitting in the senior's with the senior girls and boys at the top form. Whoever heard of such a thing? Miss Honey stood there helpless uh, before this great redneck giant. There was not a lot more she would, be, would like to have said, but she knew it was useless. She said softly, very well then, it's up to you, headmistress. You're darn right it's up to me, Miss Trunchbull bellowed. And don't forget, madam, that we are dealing here with a little viper who put a stink bomb under my desk. She did not do that, headmistress. Of course she did it, Miss Trunchbull boomed, and I'll tell you what, I wish to heavens I was still allowed to use the birch and belt as I did in the good old days. I would have roasted Matilda's bottom for her so she couldn't sit down for a month. Miss Honey turned and walked out of the study feeling depressed but by no means defeated. I'm going to do something about this child, she told herself. I don't know what it will be, but I shall find a way to help in the end. Hello there, 